This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Connected Data, the makers of the Transporter and Transporter Sync. Your data in your own private cloud, safe, secure, and cost effective. Save 10% off any Transporter model, up to $35, using the code MV10, or get $20 off the Transporter Sync with the code MV20, both at filetransporterstore.com. This edition is also sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, Mr. Ted Landau is back once again with us to share some wit and wisdom. Ted, it's great to see you as always. Thank you. Wit and wisdom, both. Well, okay. Yeah, I, ho I hope you're feeling witty. I know you're wise. Okay. <laughs> well, let's see how it goes. The two W's. <laughs> the two W's, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ted, the last time we talked, there was one topic we didn't get to um, for a variety of reasons, and I thought we'd start with that, um, and that is the, the subject of iPhone lenses. Uh, I believe you've been playing with some, and I'm kind of curious to see what your reaction is, not just to the ones you reviewed, but also to the whole concept of an iPhone lens. Sure. Uh, the first thing I say is that I have moved over the years into a direction of more and more wanting convenience over fanciness, I guess. The, you know, there was a time when, when the idea of having a camera with 16 lenses and filters and flashes and all that stuff appealed to me. Uh, uh, but, but now I'm into, you know, I, I want to carry around as little as possible and still be able to uh, get a decent picture. And with the iPhone 5, I became convinced that I could get a decent enough picture that I didn't need to carry around a second camera. And, and to be clear, not having to carry around a second camera has a lot of advantages. The, the first one being you don't have to remember to carry a second camera around with you. Uh, and, and I often don't. And many times when I wind up wanting to take pictures without having uh, anything other than my iPhone with me, and it's nice that the iPhone can now take decent pictures. Um, <clears throat> Beyond that, the iPhone it also helps unify things. You know, I don't get into the hassle of you know, did I take that picture with my iPhone or did I take it with this camera? Uh, it also helps uh, uh, in, in terms of organizing photos that easily can be um, transferred to uh, my, my Mac by a photo stream most of the time. Even if I don't want to directly connect the iPhone to to, to the Mac, uh, they're available to other devices. If I take a picture on my iPhone, I can show it on my iPad two minutes later to somebody. Uh, and, and of course, I can post things. To, to Facebook, to Twitter, whatever, relatively easy as well, much more so than I could do with a camera. So it's just nice. But still, I mean, the, the major, the major, um, my major, I guess, I can't think of the word, not complain so much, but the, the major thing I feel that I'm missing when I use my iPhone as my only camera is the ability to adjust the lens, particularly a telephoto lens. Uh, there's so many times uh, when a telephoto lens would make a picture much better. I mean, for just a, some something as basic as I'm in the audience of a concert and I want to take a picture of the stage and I'm so far back that when I take the picture it looks like I took a picture of the audience rather than the stage because the stage is off there in the distance somewhere. Uh, a telephoto lens could bring that could bring that forward, and, and even in everyday shots, sometimes you're you want to take a picture of, of, of you know the subject of your picture is someone in your family, and you want to zoom in on them, but but you can't get that close to what it is they're doing, and you'd like a zoom lens or a telephoto lens to be able to do it. Uh, and so I've I've toyed with the idea of getting an additional lens for my iPhone for for a year, for a year or more now. I've looked at the, at these lenses, and I had a chance finally to test them out. Uh, when I was given a set of lenses from Oloclip uh, to review. And of course, the one I was particularly interested in, based on what I'm saying, is the, is the telephoto lens, and that's the one I spent the most time with. And and it was good and bad. I mean, the, the, the good news is that the telephoto lens made a big difference. And I was kind of surprised because it was a, a 2X telephoto lens, which means it could only make things twice as large as the lens that came with the iPhone. And I was thinking, well, you know, I'm used to like 4X, 5X. There, there are cameras you can buy that have 10X, 12X. I mean, you know, is 2X really going to make it? And the answer is sometimes no. I mean, I, it's still, I don't think, 
I haven't had a chance to test this out. I, I still don't think it's going to be good enough to bring the stage forward when I'm in the audience of a concert or something like that. I'll still seem too far away. But in a lot of situations where I found myself over the weeks I was testing the lenses, uh, 2X did make a big difference, and, and it's really handy to have. And the lens itself is is very small and convenient from a size point of view to carry around. I sometimes worry that I'll lose it, but but, but uh, it sticks in your pocket, uh, you know, hardly any different than carrying around a few quarters or something like that. It's really quite small. And and the way the different companies uh, technically deal with how to add a lens differently, the way Olaclip works is that you just slide the lens itself over the corner of your iPhone where, where the lens opening is. And uh, and that worked as well. So uh, I, I could see using it. The, the problem that I that I have, and it's not just with Olaclip, it would be with 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 any lens, uh, uh, is that it's still something else to remember to carry around. It does make it less convenient than having an iPhone, and especially if you get into wanting to use more than one lens. Now, the telephoto lens that I had is not a zoom lens. Remember, just telephoto, and, and so Olaclip also makes a wide angle lens. So if I wanted to shift from wide angle to telephoto, I'd need two separate lenses, carrying them both around, and plus if I wanted to just take a picture without any of those lenses, then I have the basic iPhone lens, and so I, I found myself juggling all these lenses, wide angle for this shot, telephoto for that shot, both of them gone for the next shot. When I'm not using either of the lenses, what, I do, with, what do I do with them? Do I stick them back in my pocket, put them on the table? Uh, do I remember where they are later? Uh, do I hold it in my hand? Uh, it, it just, the, trying to juggle multiple lenses, trying to juggle one lens was awkward enough trying to juggle two or more, uh, I decided you know, at that point, if I'm carrying around two or more lenses and doing all this juggling, I think i just as soon go back to a point-and-shoot camera. It, 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 it really wasn't worth it. And and I think that's true, Not only, like I said, not only the Olaclip lenses, but any lens that I, that I can Im imagine getting at this point. Uh, the Olaclip lens did have one special, did have a special problem where the way that it grips the, the, uh, the iPhone loosened over time and the lens actually fell off while I was in the middle of trying to take a picture at one point. So uh, I, I could get the grip back by squeezing it, but but still, you know, I wasn't happy when I'm about to take a shot and all of a sudden the lens hits the floor. So it didn't break luckily, but, but it might have. Uh, so, and then there was also the issue of the quality of the image, which was overall good. And but I've seen uh, but had a problem which I've seen reported for other telephoto lenses as well, not just the Oloclip one, which is that the um, the side edges of the of the photo were blurry. Uh, I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that it isn't actually a substitute lens as much as putting an additional lens over the actual lens. So you're dealing with two lenses instead of one, uh, and that inevitably will cause some problems. So you know what I what I. You know, you asked me what I what I'd like to see in general. I mean, I, I'd like to see a a better way to add lenses. I'd like to see Apple design an iPhone where you could actually have a standard way of of adding uh, a lens that would be the same for every company. So so each company didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and even perhaps even more importantly, that would remain consistent from iPhone to iPhone. Because another problem that I was facing is that these lenses are made specifically to fit a particular iPhone. The lens that I have now says it will work with an iPhone 5 and a 5S. won't work with an iPhone 4, and presumably it won't work with an iPhone 6 either, which means that if I invest hundreds of dollars in getting these lenses, say I really wanted all of them for some reason, uh, and then the iPhone 6 comes out, I now have to get a new set of lenses, because my, assuming I get an iPhone 6, which I inevitably will, uh, because the the uh, the iPhone 5 lenses won't won't fit it, and so I, I'm faced with the idea of every year, maybe every two years at best, uh, I have to get a new set of lenses, and so some universal mount system would avoid that as well. So I'd really like to for Apple to pursue that, and maybe they will. I've read rumors that they may be working on something like that. The the ultimate goal would be to have a zoom lens that was built into the iPhone, and at the same time was so compact that you know that hardly took up more space than the iPhone does now. I think that's probably a science fiction dream at this point, but maybe someday it won't be. Interesting, interesting experience. Now, I've I have not used the current crop of Olaclip lenses. Um, I have them, and I'm waiting to get a chance to test them. 
Um, I have had some experience with the prior crop and had really good luck with them. Uh, I know that it, it's interesting the solutions that some of these lens makers have have decided to implement. Olo clips, of course, as you indicated, slide right on over the edge of the iPhone, and they're very tightly engineered to, mm-hmm. to you know to do it. We talked to Patrick O'Neill um, at MacWorld again, and he was kind of citing some of the statistics about just how tightly engineered these are to try to give you the best picture possible. Mm-hmm. Some other companies out there, and and Olo clip, I think, also has this, um, but they have a, a case that mm-hmm. holds the holds the lens in place a little bit more. Um, uh, if I could just interrupt you. It doesn't, it doesn't actually hold the lens in place. The the, the, what the situation is that, the, that, as you say, the lens is so tightly engineered to the K, to the iPhone itself that you can't add the Olaclip lens to any iPhone that has a case on it, basically. Uh, and, and so their solution to that is to have a case. In fact, I, th- I think I have it here. Maybe I can show it on the screen. Is to have a case... This, the case is, is on it here right now, and I guess you can see it. This is where the lens would go, right over here, yep, this would be the lens would go, and it flips up like that. So now the Olaclip lens could actually fit over the iPhone, and then when you're done, you just flip it back. Uh, and so it's not like uh, it, it's not like the case is necessary to make a better connection in any way. It just actually allows you to get out of get get the case out of the way without having to remove the case altogether. Right. Yeah, and there's some some manufacturers that have actually said, you know, here, use this case and our lenses screw into the case and, you know, therefore have a better fit and avoid some of this. iPro does that, I think. Yeah. And then of course there are the guys that, you know, have a lens this long that right. goes on your iPhone which frankly I never understood. I think that's then get a DSLR. I don't know. That's right. I, I I don't see that either. Yeah, I I I'm I don't know. I I see the advantages to carrying one device. I know when I'm out walking around, my pockets end up stuffed with you know all kind of gear and gadgets, and it's awfully convenient to have those options. Yeah, it takes a little bit of preparation, a little bit of work to say, okay, this is the lens I want, so I'll put it on. I, I like the versatility. I. It depends, I guess, on, on how much you're willing to spend on a good point-and-shoot camera. And I know the prices have come down a lot. Um, yeah, it really makes you appreciate the value, to me, anyway, of a zoom lens. You know, if, I, if I'm out taking pictures, uh, back in the days, say, when I was depending on my point-and-shoot, I'd take my point-and-shoot out. It has a wrist strap. I would keep it on my wrist, and I'd walk around with a camera on my wrist strap. And if I wanted to take a shot, I'd just lift the camera up, and I could, I could adjust the zoom instantaneously to go anywhere from wide angle to to telephoto of, of a reasonable size telephoto and then snap the shot it was, it was all very convenient at this point if so let's assume i'm holding the iphone in my hand in a similar way uh getting ready to take a shot but now i want to take a shot in a hurry uh if i don't have the telephoto lens on already let's which, which would be common i have to go into my pocket, take the telephoto lens out, and I typically keep it in the bag it came in to protect it so it doesn't get scratched while it's in my pocket. So now I have to remove it from my pocket, then I have to flip that hinge on the case, then I have to put the lens onto the onto the, uh, onto the iPhone itself, and finally I'm ready to take the shot. It, the length of time that that took me compared to just lifting up my point-and-shoot camera and adjusting the zoom was many-fold difference, and, and could make the difference between, by the time I get there, you know, the animal that I want to take a shot of has already flown away or ran away or whatever. It's much too late to take the shot. So uh, it's definitely an inconvenience in that regard, no matter how small the lens is. Yeah, and, and I'm believe me, I'm not a camera guy, but isn't there an issue just with the physicality here involved of having something as thin as the iPhone and having a lens like that that can move, that that it's just it's really difficult to do the telephoto zoom thing at at that thickness? Well, there's no zoom. It's just a telephoto. Or a telephoto, yeah. But at, but at that thickness, isn't that an issue of – and again, I don't know. The lenses have to move to focus, and that's not what you're getting here? I don't know. That might have something to do with the blurriness along the edges. I'm not sure myself what, what the cause of that is. You'd have to ask someone who worries more about those things than I do. Um, but I, the, when I compared the photo – you know, I, I took a number of test photos where I just stood in one place, took a photo, put on the telephoto lens, took the same scene with that lens to compare them later. And at least for the broad spectrum central part of the picture, the telephoto lens did an excellent job. 
the, the lighting was a little bit different, but I think that would be true of, of any zooming in, you know, because your the white balance is different because you're getting a different area uh, of, of the of the scene. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. This time around, let's talk about PDF Pen 6 and PDF Pen Pro 6, both for the Mac OS. I've had emails from viewers who ask why I rave about these two utilities, since PDFs are, to their way of thinking, somewhat immutable documents that are for viewing only. And that's true, if you don't have PDF Pen 6. But if you do, a whole new level of usefulness opens up. You can edit and correct text, create transparent backgrounds, perform OCR on your PDFs to turn them into text, insert, remove, and reorder pages, even capture PDFs directly from your scanner. You can resample images to reduce file size, an essential task when you're emailing your or anyone else's PDFs, crop pages, create tables of contents, import HTML websites, fill in form fields. I could go on and on. Need to annotate a PDF? Need to redact information so that it can't be seen? Secure it with 256-bit AES encryption? PDF Pen can do all of this and much, much more. Once you start to work with PDF Pen 6, you'll never look at PDFs the same way again. What were once locked down, read-only documents suddenly become as easy to manipulate as any text file. And that will change the way you work. I could keep reading you features from now until the end of the show, but it's much better if you try it yourself. And try it you can, for free. Download a free trial of PDF Pen 6 from smilesoftware.com and give it a shot. You will wonder why you waited this long. Then, buy from the Smile website, or if you want to be able to sync frequently used images, signatures, objects, and text via iCloud, get PDF Pen 6 or PDF Pen Pro 6 in the Mac App Store. PDF Pen, the all-purpose Mac PDF editor from Smile, the makers of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. One one thing I do want to make sure we're clear on with the OLED clips, though, and I've I've lost track. It's either two in one or three in one uh, lenses that you flip them around, you reverse them, you take an extra piece off. So when when you have one of those lenses, you're getting a two for one or three for one in that little package you're carrying around. That that, that may not affect the the situation you're talking about. In fact, it might add another step. On the other hand, there is a more, little more versatility to it. Yes, you're correct. They sell one lens that is both a wide angle and a fisheye lens. You you flip them over. You know, one side is wide angle, one side is fisheye, and then parts of the lens unscrew um, so that it becomes a macro lens in addition. Uh, so it, it functions as three lenses in one. If you want the telephoto, which for me, like I said, is the primary one I was interested in, then you need a separate lens because the telephoto lens is just a telephoto lens. And so then if you wanted to switch between telephoto and wide angle, which would be the most common switch that I would make, you're dealing with two separate lenses. Ted, this, I guess this sort of takes me to a, a, a deeper question or a broader question maybe. Um, at Macworld, Ewan Rankin from the British Tech Network was showing us a Sam, I believe it was a Samsung phone. I know it was an Android phone. And it was one of those, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, Ewan, I'll probably get the stats wrong because I didn't look it up, but like a 20 meg megapixel. I mean, it's just one of these yeah. ridiculously high quality camera mm -hmm. phones. He's a professional photographer. That's great. But this is a phone or this is a device that is is used in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. How good a, how good a camera d needs to be built in, and for the people that want to do some of this add-on stuff, is it adequate to stay use an Olo clip or use? Uh, I forget. I'm sorry, I forget the other one that you mentioned. But I, I yeah, um, you know, I guess how much is good enough? We all want absolutely perfect, but does it really make sense to put absolutely perfect into a phone and drive the price up? Well, there's no one answer for that. Uh, I think the camera is an important part of the phone because people use their iPhones and other smartphones as cameras all the time. And as, as Apple had an ad the other year, I think last year, it said more people take 
pictures with their iPhone than any other photographic device. Uh, uh, so, so clearly it's something that Apple worries about and that iPhone matters and that iPhone makers worry about. I don't want to you know, trivialize that. How much it matters, you know, where, what's the marginal utility? If Apple made the iPhone's cameras 20% better than it is now, how many, what percentage of iPhone users would care? Uh, I mean, that's, that's the question that you're asking. Certainly there would be some people that care, that professional photographer person you referred to would, would care. Um, <clears throat> though I, I have to say, as an aside, I don't think 20 pixels matters uh, anymore. I think at some point there's a diminishing return for pixels and other things affect the, the quality of the picture. But, but yeah, some people would matter. And, and I think that's... That's what people are experimenting with. Somebody, you know, I fell fall into a category where I got used to a high quality point and shoot. That was my preferred camera. Uh, it had a degree of manual control that I could use to override the automatic settings. Uh, it had a five times uh, zoom. It had a built in flash. It had um, uh, it, 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 you know, it had a number of conveniences, and I found that that was. An acceptable alternative to a to a, a single lens reflex camera for me, and I would like my iPhone. You know, the the closer that my iPhone is to matching what I could do with that point and shoot camera, the happier I am, because th at some point it means I now have this iPhone that you know, if it got to the point that the iPhone was a one hundred percent quality and feature substitute for that sing for that point and shoot camera, I could now say I'm holding in my hands an iPhone that is in every way just as good as my old point and shoot. And that would be great. Um, there are other people and, and I care about that. And so I look for how does the iPhone camera improve each time the, the iPhone comes out. And, uh, and like I said, there's this holy grail, so to speak, of, of a zoom lens that I'd like that that, that is probably still years away, if ever. Um, but there are other people I know that, on the one hand, could care less about that. And there are other people that, that there are people that back, you know, when the iPhone was an iPhone 2 and iPhone 3 and, and had a fairly crappy camera compared to what it is now, were still content with that because that's all they care about. And there, you know, there are people that I remember were using their dumb phone cameras as cameras back in those days and, and were content with that. Uh, so uh, not, not every, and then, of course, at the other end, there are the people that write articles about how to take good photos and for Macworld and other magazines and, uh, and talk about uh, the latest uh, digital SLR and all the advantages that it has and why, it, why it's a steal at $1,200. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, those people clearly aren't going to be satisfied with the iPhone as their only camera. They can be satisfied with the iPhone as a decent camera when they don't have their regular camera around, but they're never going to say, all I'm going to do is use my iPhone from now on, and I'm selling my, you know, single lens reflex camera on eBay. That's not going to happen. So, so there's there's just there's just a uh, there's just a spectrum. There's no one answer to that question. Yeah, and I guess I'm I'm looking at these add-on lenses as sort of an idea that okay, I can upgrade my camera. Uh, excuse me, my phone. I can upgrade my phone because it means uh, something to me. And the degree to which I can upgrade it is going to depend upon how much inconvenience I want, how much cost I want associated with it. Your point about you know having to upgrade the lenses constantly is a great one. That's that's a a bit of a design problem. That that oh, Equip and the others. I mean, they've had, they've had to follow along and make new versions compatible with the phones, or, or they're out of business. Um, but I'm kind of glad that I have those options. If I want to enhance the functionality, but I'm not having to to add it to the cost of my phone if it really doesn't matter to me, mm -hmm. does that make sense? It does to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I think the way I would look at it is I would I wouldn't decide whether or not you know if you're thinking that's what the, if you're thinking of giving up your single lens reflex or more likely your your point and shoot camera in favor of just going with your iPhone, which is what I've done. Uh, if you're thinking of going in that direction. I don't think it's worth considering these additional lenses in that decision one way or the other. I think you should be prepared to say, if all I have is my iPhone and no additional lenses, am I prepared to do with just that and, and not take any other camera with me? And if the answer is yes, then you're ready to switch to just using the iPhone. Once you've made that decision, then you can start thinking, you know, then you start backpedaling a little bit and say, okay, you know, I've made the decision. I'm, here I am using the iPhone. Is it worth 
is it worth it to me to consider adding a telephoto lens or or a fisheye wide angle lens and so on? You know, w would that enhance my use of the iPhone, or is it just be an added bother that will make me you know re regret that I even got them? Uh, and then you can start thinking about those things. And and again, I'll throw in one more thing too, especially with the fisheye. I think it's 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 a nice way to start experimenting with some of this stuff. If you're not quite sure about what kind of money you want to start investing in, in lenses with, you can you can take your iPhone, you can take some very nice pictures with these add-on lenses, play with some of the effects and the capabilities, and then make a decision as to whether you want to go for that $1,200 camera that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, the fisheye was fun, I have to say. I, I took some pictures with it. I, in fact, we went to a, an aquarium. And I, <laughs> so I took fisheye pictures of fish. So, you yeah. um, <clears throat> know... And and they they came out very nice. I mean, they they they, they are great special effect shots. But I'm not going to. I don't you know, on a typical. You know, if I if I were going uh, say hiking or on a vacation or something like that, the number of times that I would say, "Boy, I wish I had a fisheye lens with me. This would make all the difference." I mean, that's like never. <laughs> so so uh, it's just not how I take pictures. Maybe somebody would have a different view of it, but not me. And, and all this stuff keeps yeah. coming down in price too. Um, I've, I've not too long ago got a GoPro camera, and I'm I'm shocked and amazed at the quality of this little little device. Mm. Um, yeah, are there some compromises? Absolutely. It, it, I don't have the LCD screen to look at it. I have to pair it with my iPhone or buy a relatively expensive mm. LCD back for it. Mm -hmm. But the quality that's out there for shooting video and stills is mm. is just kind of amazing at this point. Mm. Yeah, and video. Speaking of video, it's it's incredibly uh, impressive. The iPhone or any point and shoot camera, but but certainly with the iPhone, the quality of the HD video that you get. Uh, I mean, five years ago, I couldn't imagine getting anything close to that quality with something that cost five times as much and was ten times as big. I mean, it's just it's just it's just hard to believe what you can get out of an iPhone now. Yeah, yeah. so there are a lot of a lot of options out there, and and folks, you know. Go and play with them. I, I, you're missing out if you're not because you've got this incredible still camera. You've got this incredible video camera. Uh, whether you choose to invest in the lenses, hey, that, that's your decision. But by all means, uh, start documenting things and taking pictures of your life. And, and share them with Ted and I. That's right. Send them especially to Chuck who will then forward them to me. Thank you. <laughs> Transporter from Connected Data is sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. Your data in your own private cloud. Safe, secure, and cost-effective. So I ask you, are you using cloud storage from the likes of Dropbox, SugarSync, or Box? Isn't it convenient to have information available to all your devices everywhere, automatically syncing back and forth so nothing is ever out of date? Except, of course, when you reach your storage limit for whatever level of service you're paying for. And paying for and paying for, since all those services require you to pony up varying amounts of cash for storage. When you look at the cost of hard drives these days on a per gigabyte basis, and then compare that to what you're paying for cloud storage, you wonder where all that money is going. What you know is that it's leaving your pocket, that's for sure. That's why I'm loving my transporters. Yes, I said transporters because I have more than one, but that's a story for another day. What you need to know now is the Transporter is much more affordable than the others. No, I mean much more affordable. Compare a one terabyte Transporter at $249 to half that much Dropbox storage, 500 gigs, at an annual cost of $499, and you start to understand. And that was an annual cost, so you're going to pay it again next year, and the next, and the next. Wouldn't you rather do something more fun with that money? Buy a new iPad? Buy some Apple stock after the split? Or make that trip to Macworld next year that you've been promising yourself? You could fund any of those with the savings you're going to see when you pick up a transporter for your cloud storage needs. And that doesn't touch some of the other benefits of transporter, like automatic uploading of your photos and videos from your iPhone via the brand new version of the file transporter app, or the security of transporter's private encrypted downloads, or the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your data is on your transporter and that your transporter is safe on your desk or in your server room, not sitting in some server farm in who knows where, just waiting for who knows who to take a run at it. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, there's no reason not to try Transporter. But there's an even better reason. 
Right now, you can get 10% off any transporter up to $35 by using the code MV10. Or get $20 off the transporter sync with the code MV20, both at filetransporterstore.com. That's even more savings over the money you're showing out now. Might even buy you a little extra legroom on that flight to Macworld. Filetransporter.com and the codes MV10 and MV20 to save you money, improve your privacy and security, and expand your personal cloud. Win, win, win. Transporter and Transporter Sync. Your data in your own private cloud, safe, secure, and cost-effective. Thanks to Connected Data for their ongoing support of Mac Voices. Uh, well, Ted, the other thing, since we, uh, since we were together, the other thing that happened was Apple had its quarterly results mm-hmm. on the call. And there were a lot, a lot of stats, and folks have probably heard about most of them. But I was kind of interested to see how you feel about a, a seven-for-one stock split. Um, and I don't know, at this point, should we do a disclaimer that we both are owners of some Apple stock? Is that probably sure. appropriate? I own a considerable amount of Apple stock, uh, relatively speaking. Yeah, I'm certainly not a predominant shareholder, but it, 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 it adds up to money. Yes. Okay, and, and I add enough that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm excited by a seven to one stock split. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seven to one was certainly more than I would have ever expected. They'd never done anything other than a two to one stock split before. Uh, you know, I read one article that said you know, they, that they perceived that multiple stock splits would probably be necessary over the next few years for the direction they were going. And so rather than keep doing that, they got it over with all at once and say, here it is, seven for one, we're not going to do any more stock splits for the next 10 years or something like that. So um, <clears throat> that may be what was going on. The, the, the big issue I think that you're raising, uh, and you can take me in another direction if I'm wrong, uh, is... Is a stock, you know, is there something to get excited about about a stock split? Does it represent something good? Uh, it certainly, you know, the, the psychologically, it always seems that just, oh, suddenly I have seven times more stock than I had. I, I had a hundred shares of Apple, and now I have seven hundred shares of Apple. Wow, <laughs> um, that's cool. Uh, of course, you have seven hundred shares of Apple at that point that are worth one seventh of what your hundred shares were. Uh, so it really amounts to, you know, in, in a in a perfect universe, so to speak. It really amounts to to nothing because you're, you're in terms of a gain or a loss. Uh, but I still think, I mean, to me, I think there's a there there are two ways in which the stock split I think works to the investor's advantage. Um, one is that uh, and this is this is again it's a little bit psychological more than more than real. But I but I think there's some reality too. Uh, one one is that that. There's a, you know, the stock stock can only go up. Stock has to go up at least a penny. As I, as I don't th- I don't think you get fractions of a penny for stock value. Um, <clears throat> and, and and let's say for the sake of argument, the stock tends you know a point represents a dollar, and so let's say that the stock tends to go up a point or more when when it goes up. So you know, it goes up one point, it goes down one point, whatever. Uh, and again, again, I'm fudging here a little bit, but I know people who are, <laughs> I can imagine people on the phone calling already saying, this is not the right way to look at it. But anyway, <laughs> um, in, in this fictional universe that I'm creating, if a stock goes up a dollar, it, the, the, the percentage of that increase is more if the stock is valued less. So, for instance, if a stock is going at $10 a share and it goes up $1, well, then it just went up 10%. If a stock is going for $1,000 a share and it goes up $1, it's hardly anything. And so when, when stock is valued so high, uh, it has to go up a lot before it makes a big difference. You know, when Apple stock is going for $700 a share, as it was at one point a couple of years ago, it has to go up quite a lot before before it makes a difference in how much money your stock is worth. Uh, and so I think there's a, there's a hope when the stock goes down. Maybe it's more, than a, more of a hope than a reality that by dropping the stock price so dramatically, it's going to allow for fluctuations that will amount to bigger increases than if it had stayed high. And that may be true or it may not, but I think psychologically that's what people think. The other thing that happens, and this is a little bit more real, I think, is that it allows for a wider range of investors. The, that uh, when when a stock is going for seven hundred dollars a share, and you have seven hundred dollars to invest in Apple stock, it means you can only buy one share, 
And not too many people are going to get excited about buying one share of Apple stock with their $700. But if you can buy seven shares with that $700, you might be tempted to do that. And, and especially when you start talking about investing $5,000 or $10,000 in Apple stock, uh, the difference between a $700 stock and a, and a $70 stock is, is, or a $660 stock is, is, uh, would be quite huge. So, um, <clears throat> So in, in that, and I think that in turn, that could be good or bad. I suppose you know it, it could it, in, a, in a in a good market, in a market that is generally going up. I think lowering the price will result in in a greater accumulation of value after the stock is split, uh, as a result of those two things. And so I think that's the main reason to look forward to a stock split. But there's no guarantee that you're going to be in a market where the stock goes up, and there's no guarantee that anything that I'm saying is going to actually turn out to be true. Uh, but I think that's the that's the mirage possible reality that a stock split represents. I, I think you've you hit it on the head. I I personally like the idea that more people can get into this. I think that that the lower price will hopefully limit some of the volatility of it. Um, which, and we've gone over this plenty of times with different analyst speculations and creative fiction and, you know, some of their wants versus what they really believe are going to happen. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've driven the price up. They drive the price down. They drive the price sideways. Yeah. It makes me crazy. And I'm hoping that, you know, with this, okay, it'll, it'll still bounce a little bit, but it's not going to bounce nearly as much. And, and I like that. I like the idea, too, of being able to go to my user group and say, you know what? Okay, you, you could buy one share of Apple stock or you could buy a fully loaded iPad. Mm -hmm. Now you'll be able to buy, as you said, seven seven shares or so for the sake of a fully loaded iPad. So that has a lot more appeal. There's also a lot less downside to a $75 stock, and, and we're just picking numbers, folks, but you know, to a $75 stock than a $700 stock or $600 stock. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I feel like for whatever I'm – Whatever I'm buying, I can lose less money by investing in that direction. So that also has a certain positive effect, I think, on it. Yeah, I, I will. Of course, there will never be any way of knowing what would have happened if the stock hadn't split, because you can't bifurcate that way and look at both. But I'm confident that a year from now, Apple stock will will be worth more than if it hadn't split. I think that's very likely. And that's just my belief. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's worse. Well, I, I think it's worth something, but you know, Ted. I, again, because of that, of the volatility and the the difficulty of getting in, mm. I've never completely understood why why Google and and Apple, at, when they got to that point, and Microsoft and some others have sort of bragged about the fact that well, our stock is worth this much per share, and it's like, yeah, but only institutional investors really can afford to get into it in any significant fashion. Mm -hmm. At that point, yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> if you had bought, uh, it was it uh, the, the Berkshire Hathaway stock, Warren Buffett stock, stock? I think is like thirty five thousand dollars a share now, or something like that. Some ridiculously high point. But some, I did read an article that said if you bought one thousand dollars worth of the stock, I think it was um, back in nineteen sixty four, you'd be a multimillionaire now. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, but who's buying a thirty-five thousand dollars per share? So now, it's, yeah, now it's too late. Back in nineteen sixty-four, it wasn't thirty-five thousand dollars a share. That's the point. So, yeah. well, if we'd have bought Xerox back in the sixties, if you'd have bought Polaroid, if you bought the right things, yeah. and then gotten out, <laughs> yeah, you have to know to get out too. That's right. Yeah, no, no one to hold them, no one to fold them. I mean, the stock market is not a is not a, not a place for low risk people. That's for sure. <clears throat> And we probably should say, folks, again, Ted and I are not licensed to give stock advice, so anything you hear us say, take with a, a big salt shaker. Yes, that would be true. Yes, yes. And if you have stock tips, send them to Ted. I'll in take your photos. Ted will take the stock tips. In fact, this entire podcast is going to be destroyed after you listen to it. So, <laughs> Well, I hope not because then there won't be any point. <laughs> no, I mean, after everyone listens to it. It gets destroyed oh. for that person immediately after they listen to it. I like the old mission impossible that once yeah. they listen to it, it's self destructed. Okay, I like that. I like that. We're sorry for any residue that's left in, in your iPod. That's right. 
So the other thing we have on our on our radar, Ted, is uh, WWDC. Uh, mm. It's coming up in uh, well, just a little more than a couple weeks at this point. Do you have? Yeah, do you have uh, any expectations at this stage? And, and note, I said no rumor, not rumors, but expectations. I think, and this is based a little bit on the rumors that I've been reading, but they seem reasonable. I think the biggest thing that's going to come out of of WWDC is a major new version of OS X. I think that um, the lion's share, as it were, uh, of attention last year went to the major redesign of, of iOS for iOS 7. And the changes in, in Mac OS X were, were minimal by in contrast. Uh, and, I, and so it's been, and of course, Mountain Lion represented a somewhat minor change over line prior to that. And so it's been several years now since there's been a really big change in, in OS X. I think it's due. And from some of the things that I've read recently, uh, that's exactly what we can expect. Now, there have been some things to suggest that uh, that, people, that that Apple engineers are working on making uh, Mac OS X look and feel more like iOS. Uh, and I think, I mean, there's two ways to view that. Uh, one is a bad way, or not not a bad way to view it, but m- meaning bad news if it's true, and that is that it's more of this shift towards making OS X work exactly like iOS with all the restrictions that iOS has. You know, well, ultimately, you know, then the sort of doomsday nightmare scenario is that the day is going to come when the only way you can get apps for your Mac is through the App Store, just like the only way you can get them for iOS now is through the iOS App Store. Uh, and, and that, well, Apple will shut down access to the system folder in the same way that you can't get to the system folder on, I, on an iPhone now and so on. Um, I'm you know, there was a time when I was worried about that, admittedly. Uh, I think that time is over. I think it's pretty clear that Apple, certainly in, in any foreseeable future, isn't intending to do that. And so the fact, w- when I hear that they're trying to make OS X more like iOS, I'm not any more worried that that's what that means. Uh, I think what it means more likely is that they want to unify the look and feel, and as much as possible without affecting those core things that we just talked about, how things work. Uh, and, and that makes, you know, it's like, to me, and that's a positive thing, to me it's like uh, the Notes app, to take one example. Right now, when I launch Notes on my Mac, it is almost identical to launching it on the iOS the way in terms of how it works. Uh, admittedly, one uses a touchscreen and one uses a trackpad or a mouse. But aside from that, uh, they work, they look, they feel, they work exactly the same way. And any notes that I create on my iOS device are automatically available on my Mac and vice versa. It's all very well integrated. It wasn't always that way. That was something that they changed uh, in either Mountain Lion or, or Mavericks, I forget. I think in Mavericks. Uh, and a change in that direction makes it so that when you're used to how something works on one platform, you already know a lot about how it's going to work on the other app platform, and I think that's good. And if that's what they mean by by making the two more similar, I think that's a move in a positive direction. How about iCloud and the idea that, and especially with the iWork apps, uh, Numbers Pages, Keynote, yeah. that we know that they've been working on parity between those devices so that you can use your iPad to work on your, your iWork projects and you can then shift over to the Mac. And you can even work on them uh, on a PC if you use the web version. Mm-hmm. You think this is a good area that – take that back. You think this is a, an area that Apple really needs to work on, the whole common kind of platform for some of the productivity apps? Well, th- that depends on what Apple hopes to accomplish with iCloud. For me, iCloud – I mean, there's a lot I like about iCloud, and, I, and I'm happy to use it, and I do use it quite a lot. But a, as the only available cloud um, service, it would leave a lot to be desired. Uh, I still use Dropbox, for example, much more than I use iCloud. And the biggest and the biggest complaint about iCloud is one that I made from from Word Go, and and that others have made as well, is how closed it is. Like you know, like almost everything else about iOS. That that is, th- there's no you can't. You can't access a document from anything other than the application that created that document. So if I, it, you know, if I create something uh, on in, on my Mac, say in text edit, I can save that file to Dropbox, and it's available 
from uh, from the Finder of any other Mac that I have. It's available to any other application. I, you know, I can go to the open dialog box of Microsoft Word or Pages and locate that text edit document and open it up very easily, uh, and so on. Whereas if I create a, if that same document, if I that's if I save it to Dropbox. If I save that text edit document, for instance, to iCloud on the Mac, it's it's not available anywhere on the iPhone. I can't even find it on the iPhone because there is no text edit equivalent app on the iPhone that accesses those documents. It's just like it just disappeared as far as the iPhone is concerned. And it's things like that that drive you crazy. And uh, I, Apple, I think, it, 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 I think the reason Apple doesn't do it now um, and has never done it is is because of its desire to keep. But partly it's the sandboxing and the security and the whole you know, whole rigmarole you can go in that direction but i also think it's part of the their mentality of wanting to keep the um access to the co core level of the operating system closed uh, and the, the, the one point there was talk that a version of ios was actually going to have a common area called shared where all the shared documents would go and then they abandoned that at the last minute, according to what I read, and, and went with the way that things now work instead. Uh, and it, it, they simply don't want uh, a system where you have open access to 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 put, to put to, no other way I can put it to, to to have such easy open access to uh, for multiple apps to access the same area, because then what you do in one app can affect what happens in another app, and that that is something that they have tried to very much restrict. Playing devil's advocate, because I, I've, I come from the same school that you do, in that I like to be able to move things between applications. But do you think there's, there's room for the concept that once a page is document, always a page is document? And if I want the content out of that to move over into Keynote, that I should be doing it by by cut and paste or copy and paste, and I realize that you can't open a pages document in a keynote document, so that's not right. the best example. But the, the whole idea that okay, I'm I'm going to create this, and this is where it's going to live, and this is the kind of document it is, and there there's a limited need to manipulate things in different programs. Yeah, I'm not there, I guess, and also, I mean. Again, maybe I'm old school, but when I'm working on a project, another thing is I like to keep similar, um, not similar files, but similar um, purposed files together. For instance, if I'm working on an article for like Mac World magazine, frequently the article will have a text document which I then convert to an HTML document because when I submit it to Mac World, they want it in HTML format this is going to be posted online. And I frequently have figures, screenshots that I've taken that are going to be included in the articles. So I have some JPEG files. Um, <clears throat> and so I, mean, I have at least, say, three different files, uh, an RTF document, an HTML document, and a JPEG. I typically will create a folder, name the folder with a version of the title of the article. Maybe it's iPhone lenses, say, to talk about the the because I don't know, we mentioned it. I don't know if we mentioned it, but this our whole discussion of iPhone lenses derives from an article that was posted to MacWare last week. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and so I'll make, make a folder called iPhone lenses and put all three of those items in there. And then whenever I open that folder, everything I've created relative to um, the, this article will be there. In fact, I'll even sometimes there'll be some other articles from the web that are on a similar subject that I might be wanting to link to in my article. And so I'll keep the copies of those articles there as, as Safari web archive files or PDFs even sometimes uh, so that when I want to create the link, I, I have the article at hand. So I have maybe a half dozen now files of various different types that are all in this folder. If I was to try to do that on the iPhone, other than doing it in something like Dropbox, uh, if I was to do it through iCloud specifically, it's just impossible. There's no way that I could do that. And I, one could argue that, that Apple wants a world in which that doesn't matter. You know, Apple is looking to get rid of the Finder ultimately, and, and they don't want us to have to you know, organize things that way. They, just, you know, they want to take the approach that all your files are just going to be in one huge vat somewhere, and filtering and search requests will, will, will um, uh, get them so I could assign a keyword to each of those files. And where I sign iPhone lenses as some sort of keyword, and then I enter a search term that says iPhone lenses, and all those articles will pop up because they all have that keyword or, 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 or tab key or whatever. Um, 
and I suppose that's a you know that may that may be a viable solution at some point. It still wouldn't work very well on the iPhone at this point as a solution, though it could work on the Mac. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, there's there's just all those aspects of things that I find the way iCloud works now to be unacceptable. But uh, uh, again, maybe maybe someday that will change. And, and and iCloud, I mean, another thing that Dropbox allows that, that iCloud doesn't work well is I can share things with Dropbox much more easily and I can, I can put 10 files in an iCloud folder maybe you want you know maybe you say oh those articles that you mentioned in the podcast Ted I'd like I'd like you to send them to me I want to read them after after we're done recording this so I'll say oh sure I'll just put them in my you know they're too big for me to want to email them to you but I'll just put them in my Dropbox folder called Chuck and you'll be able to get them from there and I can do that really easily cannot do that with iCloud I, iCloud to me is – iCloud and Dropbox, I know they're both cloud services, but to me they're different cloud services. Yeah, there's some. There's definitely some overlap. It's like a Venn diagram. You know, there's there's no question there's an overlap in some functions, but iCloud was never designed to share programs outside. It was only designed to share it really for you and and what you're doing um, with between your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac, and, you know, maybe – in the web browser, um, I, or Dropbox is more of a storage, almost a, a filing cabinet in the cloud kind of thing, with some extra enhancements. So, I trying to compare the two. I, I I sometimes think it's almost like trying to compare the Mac and the iPad. There, there's you can do a lot of the same things, but they're basically different animals. And and I can't argue with your because I work exactly the same way you do. If I have a project. That's where all my assets go into there until I start to put them together in whatever I'm putting them together in. So that does present a problem if you're trying to do the iPad-like operating system. Excuse me, I, iOS operating system. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't disagree with you. In fact, I think I said at the beginning that I like iCloud and I use it for a lot of things. I just would never want it to be my only cloud service. If, if, if Dropbox went away... Or if Apple decided that somehow they were going to block Dropbox from working because they wanted to force everybody to use iCloud, uh, I'd be real unhappy. But I'm not faced with that situation. I have Dropbox, and so I use it for situations where iCloud doesn't work, and it works out pretty well. Uh, I still would like to see iCloud move in some directions that make it closer to how Dropbox works, like the text edit example that I gave you before I still find frustrating. Uh, but it doesn't have to become a substitute for Dropbox for iCloud to be successful. I agree with you. It, it's always fun to, ahead of WWDC, to speculate and, and look for maybe what we want rather than what we expect. And I, I would love to see iCloud get a little bit more stable, maybe gain a few more capabilities, whether they're Dropbox, Dropbox lot like or not. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm kind of anxious to see what they will do next with the, the Mac OS and how much more function they can build into it. Yeah, what what what? It's hard. It would be hard for me to come up with a long laundry list of things I want OS ten to do that it can't do now. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty fine just the way it is. So, the the big unknown for me in terms of WWDC is hardware. I, I, I'm thinking back, and I may be wrong, but it seems to me that every um, every WWDC for the past several years, even though the emphasis has been on software OS ten iOS. The keynote has introduced some significant new hardware. Last year was the Mac Pro, for instance, was the big announcement. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm I'm anticipating that there will be some significant hardware announcement. And the answer and the question is, what will it be? And the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, and the, the world, the Wall Street Journal, or All Things Digital, one of those sites, um, uh, apparently put the kibosh on uh, a new Apple TV or a iWatch um, coming out. For, for WWDC, and I think that's pretty reasonable. I would agree with that. Um, and, and so what is it, what is going to come out? Uh, I, I, there's no sign that there's anything like the rumored iPad Pro. I, I don't even know that that's ever going to come out at this point. So um, that doesn't seem to be likely in the works. A new iPhone 6 or a new iPad, I think we're not going to see them until the fall. Uh, so I don't anticipate that. And so really... Uh, they just refreshed the the MacBook Air line. Are, are they going to come out with a major new version for WWDC? I don't think so. Uh, 
I'm not sure. Maybe a new, maybe a major redesign of the iMac, though I haven't seen any rumors to that effect. But you know, that's that's something that occurs to me. Uh, uh, an upgrade to the Mac Mini would be nice. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but again, I haven't seen any significant rumors of that. So as, as far as I can tell, there are there's nothing in terms of hardware that that people are convinced is going to is going to be announced at WWDC. And if there's no hardware announced, that would be kind of a surprise too. So we'll wait and see. Wouldn't be the first time that Apple, you know, mm. broke broke the quote unquote tradition of what they've done in the past and surprised everybody maybe, you know, a month later mm -hmm. with something. I, I I would have to say out of the ones you mentioned, I would think that some kind of at least refresh of the Mac Mini would, would seem to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. And that almost seems anticlimactic. Unless it's a real redesign. Mm -hmm. So Well and another thing that might be coming that wouldn't be as big a deal as some of these other things is some sort of 4K display uh, because there's been all sorts of rumors about how 4K support is increasing in the operating system and certainly having a 4K display to go with last year's Mac Pro would be would be nice uh, and uh, it's certainly been a while since Apple has done anything special with their cinema displays so you know, a 4K display could be coming uh, and, and maybe who knows there could even be a 4K display iMac though I, I doubt it um, <clears throat> But, uh, yeah, that's something that occurs to me. 4K iMac. I really haven't thought about that one. I don't think so. I think it's, it's too much money for not enough benefit. I, I don't think, I think, uh, people wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, care that much to, to make it worth it at this point. The 4K displays would have to be cheaper before, before that would be practical. But what do I know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we, we will find out in, uh, in three weeks or so. Mm-hmm. And that, I guess that means, based on our schedule, that we should be talking one more time before WWDC. So maybe we will refine our uh, our mm. wants and desires by then. Yeah, the other thing, and one, other, uh, so one other thing about it, I, yeah. I know there's not going to be any sort of major Apple television announcement, not like the long, long rumored total redesign where they actually come out with a television substitute. Uh, but there's also been talk about a major update to the Apple TV that now exists. And that supposedly too is not coming, uh, but I, I, I'm I hold out a little more hope for that. I think that's something that would fit nicely with coming out at WWDC, because especially if they did something like, I mean, here's total fantasy. It's not based on any evidence whatsoever. Uh, one of the things about WWDC is that it's developer oriented, and so how could a new Apple TV? Be of a special interest to developers. Well, if they opened up a, an app store for the Apple TV uh, that that allowed you to develop channels, at the very least, for the Apple TV that that, that you could add it's more like the way Roku works now, for instance, if they did something in that direction, uh, then that would be you know they and we they could say, well, now we're going to release the SDK that will allow you to do that here at WWDC. The unit itself may not go on sale until September or something like that, but we're announcing it now so the developers can get started working on it or something like that. That 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 would fit nicely too, and that's something I could imagine. Whenever we go into these major events, though, there's always nothing. Uh, no, not always, but there's very seldom something that it's like. Ah, like here's here's, uh, here's Tim Cook calling now to correct me on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Tim. <laughs> uh, one sec. Yeah, I told Tim I was doing a podcast. He got off. Okay. Well, that, that was nice of him. <laughs> no, th there's nothing that's ever really certain as we head into some of these things. There, there are rumors that gain more credence, but uh, you just you just got to sit and wait and see. Yeah. Although one thing I did want to throw in on the on the Apple TV, this is with this would be my wish. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see an app on my iPhone or my iPad that connected to my Apple TV and let me rearrange the, all the, the, the channel tiles mm -hmm. the way you can on an iPhone or iPad because trying to do it with, with the remote, I mean, yes, can you, will you be able to do it? I'm sure they'll figure out a way to do it, mm -hmm. but it would be very nice to just have, you know, log into the Apple TV, have all your little icons quiver and be able to drop them into folders and rearrange them to your heart's content. Mm -hmm. that's, oh. that's what I would like. That'd be nice. Okay, I'll go for that. Call Tim back and tell him. Okay, after we get off, I, he's going to call me back in a few minutes. Okay, good. Well, I don't want to keep you then. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ted, it's good to talk to you. Thanks so much. All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Folks, we'll see you back here, too, on uh, Mac Notables on Mac Voices. I'm Chuck Joyner. As always, thanks for watching.
Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date with all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Backbeat.